Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this Show Us Your Portfolio episode, we talk with Ben Hunt, founder of the research company Epsilon Theory, about his views on what is important to him in life and where he channels his investments. Ben's views on his personal portfolio are different than many others, but I think you'll find his overarching philosophy on what is and isn't important in life thought-provoking and unique. Ben is a deep thinker, student of history, and is considered by many an expert on the importance of narratives and how they shape society and the markets. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Epsilon Theory's Ben Hunt. Just one more thing before we start. Excess Returns has been growing a lot recently, and all of that is a result of the support from our loyal listeners and viewers. We just want to thank everyone who has taken the time to listen to us and for supporting us and allowing us to continue to reach more and more investors. If you have a minute to do it, we would ask one favor of you. If you have benefited from the podcast and could take the time to subscribe on YouTube or your preferred audio platform and to write a review, that would be greatly appreciated. Both are a big part of expanding the podcast and will allow us to continue to get great guests. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Hi, Ben. Thank you very much for joining us today. Great to be here, Justin. Appreciate it. Usually when we, you've come on with us, we're talking about macro related topics or investing narrative, things that are sort of moving the market from a behavior and and, and sentiment standpoint. But I think today we wanted to um, talk to you about something very different and that's how you view your own personal investments, your uh, where you're investing or where you're not investing, how you go about thinking about your, uh, long-term wealth creation. I think this is going to be, um, an interesting discussion because I think some people are going to be surprised as we get into a couple of things. I think so. Right. So, but I mean, maybe, maybe to start out, if you just want to, when you, when you think about your long-term goals and objectives with the assets that you have, that you control. Um, what are you re- trying to accomplish with those? Yeah, Matt, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Brian Portnoy, uh, he wrote a book on this and I think he's really right. He talks about a uh, funded contentment. And I, I think for me, that's, that is what I'm trying to achieve is that, that notion of funded contentment. Uh, I'm 58 years old, right? I, I love what I do. We can talk about what I do and why I do what I do and how that impacts what I think about investing. Uh, But it's, um, I want enough money to live a life well lived. And that's why I've, that's why I invest like I invest. What is your idea of a life well lived? Would you say? Uh, I want to take care of my pack, right? Which is uh, my family. Um, I, as, you know, extend it as much as I can, right? So that, that, that does come one for me. I, th- I think that that's true for a lot of people. And two is I want to, I've got something to say. <laughs> I, and and so, I, so I want to be able to say it. I, I don't want to look back and, um, yeah, not have, um, I want to shoot my shot, right? I want to, I, I want to say what I want to say. And, uh, that's, that to me is a, a life well lived. Some people view retirement as, you know, a time where they can go off into the sunset and maybe play golf or move down to Florida or do the things that everyone's different, do what they want to do in retirement. When you think about your retirement, what do you sort of envision? Do you think you're maybe going to never retire because you're in a job that, you know, you can continue to do for a long, long time, or, you know, do, do you think about re- retiring and, um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Really for the last 15 years, what I've tried to do is I've tried to make my job, uh, match more closely with who I am and who I am is I'm a writer. This sounds highfalutin. I'm, I'm an artist. I am. I, I think that is frankly, our highest calling is to make good art. And you know, I, so my I think I've expressed this maybe most 
popularly with people when they say, you know, what's the value of Bitcoin? The value of Bitcoin to me is it's good art. And, and, and people, when I say that, they think it's a put down and it's not at all. To me, that's my highest, my highest praise. So who I am is a writer. Uh, that's my art. And I hope I expect to be able to doing that until, you know, the day I can't string some thoughts together. And at that point, you know, it's time to, you know, pull the plug. So, so for me, I, I can't help myself. It's not something I do because necessarily I think I'm good at it. I think I am a pretty good writer, but I am compelled to write. I get a lot of people ask me, oh, you know, I want to write. We've had a ton of people come onto our website and say, okay, I want to start writing and say, sure, show me this. Say, oh, they have all these plans. I want to write, you know, 52 notes in this series. I want to do something, you know, every week. And I say, just slow down, <laughs> right? Because it, it, it never works out that way. If you're writing because, or this, and this, this applies to anything, not just writing. Uh, for something that you can do for your entire life. If you're doing it because you want to do it for extrinsic reasons, it's not something you're going to do for your entire life. In terms of writing, it's not something you're going to do for more than a few months. It, it has to be intrinsic. You have to feel literally compelled to do it. And I, I, I am. I can't help myself but to write. So the, the, the question, you know, is it something you can do, you know, past retirement, it doesn't, it doesn't connect for me because what I do, the writing, I am compelled to do it. It is who I am. And that's a big part of the funded contentment. I, I need to be able to continue to write and yet still take care of my pack. Yeah. And to pick up on your point, you know, I read a weekly article and it's, it's tough. I mean, you know, I can understand why people, you know, don't, don't continue after they start. Like, I mean, it takes a commitment and it takes writing something that you really are passionate about to keep doing it. Because if you're, if you're not passionate about what you're writing about, you're not going to keep doing it on a, on a weekly basis. I use this word compulsion and it's not a pretty word, right? We don't think of compulsion as, you know, a nice word and it's not, but that is, and in, in, in my experience, what is required to be an anything of and, and that, you know, to be a musician, right? To be a writer, to be a painter, right? To be a sculptor, to be a stock analyst, right, as something you want to keep doing forever, is it a compulsion? And again, not a pretty word, but I think that's really what it takes. And for anyone who's listening, I mean, of the two, of all the writers I read in, in you know, finance, and you're a little bit outside of finance as well, I mean, I would say you and Morgan Housel are the two best writers I've ever read. So, I mean, I, I would strongly recommend anybody read your work. I mean, every time I write an article I'm, and read one of yours, I'm like, I wish I could do this, um, but I can't come close. But yeah, your writing is, is really excellent. Thank you. Well, that's uh, that's high praise. That's high praise. I really appreciate that, Jack. And the, the, the thing I'll say to people is that whatever it is that you find that you are compelled to do, your voice in that, and it's easy to talk about voice when you're talking about writing, but there's a voice to anything that you make as the source of your identity. You have a voice as a stock analyst, <laughs> right? If that's your identity. Uh, it changes in the doing and that's so um, wonderful and that's how it can sustain you for a lifetime because your your voice whatever that means to you for whatever you're compelled to do it really does grow you get better at it um and that's uh that's again what adds to the intrinsic reward here Moving uh, to your portfolio, one of the things I thought would, would be a requirement when we did our Show Us Your Portfolio series is that there actually was a public portfolio to show. Um, but when I, when I DM'd you on Twitter about doing this, you said, well, the first thing I need to tell you is I don't have a public portfolio. So, so I'm wondering if maybe just, just as a starting point, if you can maybe explain why that is, why you choose not to have a public portfolio. I'll, I'll talk about it in kind of a big kind of terms, and then I'll talk about it in very personal terms, right? The, 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 the big term I'll talk about is that I think that what happens a lot of time with people who are professionals in markets is that they mistake their seat for themselves. And what I mean by that in terms of your personal portfolio is that by virtue of the work which I do in the company that I started with my partner, Rusty Gwynn, 
we have an enormous amount of financial market risk in our business, in our day job. An enormous, I mean, that we're levered to financial markets. You know, we're not in, I mean, we have a hedge fund, right? So that's obviously, you know, connected with that. It's not, you know, it's market neutral. So you would think, well, what do you mean it's got financial market risk? All, all of the people that we depend on to make our business, whether it's subscriptions for what we write, whether it's for um, our LPs and, and you know, our, our, our investment strategies, right? their experience in financial markets impacts their experience with us. It, anybody who is involved in markets for a living is taking your long financial markets, your long financial market stability, your long financial market, uh, your long number go up. You just are. So from a kind of larger point of view, that top-down kind of non-personal view, I think is really important when you think about your investment portfolio, that it provide a different set of risks than your job. I, I, mean, I mean, any of the RIAs who are, you know, listening to this know what I'm talking about, where, you know, somebody, a client will have retired from, you know, pick a company, you know, Boeing, right? And they've got a big portfolio in Boeing stock and they know the company, they love it. That's getting them to diversify. That can be a challenge. My point is that it's not just diversification from this stock to that stock, this sector to that sector. It's diversification, not just on asset class, it's diversification in the entire avenue of the world of life that you're engaged in. And my work life is financial markets. So I've, I've got enough financial market risk there without adding to it with investing in publicly traded securities. That's the top view, right? But now I can tell you the personal view. Oh, no, yeah, go, go ahead. It's trite to say that you want to bet on yourself, but um, I actually really believe that. And this goes back to that notion of what makes a life worth living. So I've got three things that I do with my money. And when I say three things, these are the only three things. I am very long. I am levered long <laughs> to my company, uh, to my home, and to my children's education. That's it. That's literally it. I've got some cash, right, that's there as that buffer for life and, you know, when things come up and you need cash, I've, I've got that. But, but I have three investments. My investment portfolio are the three things that I want to make a bet on. Uh, that lead to my contentment. And that's my company. That's my home. Uh, I'm not saying house, it's my home. Right? And, uh, and, and my, my children's education. That's it. Those are the bets I want to make. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's such a cool way to look at things. You know, some, we all tend to get too wrapped up, I think, in financial markets and maybe lose track of you know, what's actually important in our lives sometimes, especially when things are going on like they are now in markets, you know, we tend to get too worried about that. And it's great. I mean, you don't have like that concern I have where I'm looking at my portfolio, you know, you don't even have that. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, nothing you're doing is marked to market every, you're not, you know, I, I would think it's a much better, happier life, not, not worrying about that stuff. In my, my business, right. We have, like I say, there's, we're immersed in market risk all the time and it's marked to market this and what's the price doing of that and how are we doing this and, and, and like that. I want to separate my, to the degree I can, my investment portfolio away from that, right? To the other things that are at the core of my life, which are my pack, my kids, their education, and my home. So, so that's how I'm approaching it. I know it's pretty different. I'll, I'll say one other thing too, and this goes, goes back to, to being a writer who does write about markets. It's very important to me that when I write, and I write about, I might mention a company. I mean, nothing I do is really, yeah, I'm not a tout. I don't write about stock picks, right? Though I've never done that. But I will write about companies sometimes. I've got a big note coming out, you know, today, tomorrow, that's going to talk about Google and Apple and Meta. And it's very important that I be able to say, you know what? I got no dog in this fight. 
other than what I really believe is going on here. So there is an enormous, I find, um, insulation that I can achieve from, I'll call it criticism, but it's doubt, it's, it's aspersions, right? For writing about markets by not having any positions in markets. I think that's, it's just so, it's so, um, helpful to me. And it's, uh, I, I think allows me to write where the reader is more trusting of my authenticity with what I write. There's not that, because that is the coin of our realm today. It's authenticity. Um, and you know, once you squander that, it's really hard to get back. So that's the other reason why I don't want to have a publicly traded or, or investments in publicly traded stuff is that I don't want there to be anything that can be used to question my authenticity when I write and mention a, a publicly traded company. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I want to drill down on some of the individual components of your portfolio a little bit. Um, for, for people who aren't familiar with it, can you talk a little bit about what Epsilon Theory is and what you're trying to accomplish with it? Yeah, so um, Epsilon Theory is the brand name for the company that my partner Rusty Gwynn and I founded four years ago. And the company's name is Second Foundation Partners. So that's a, comes from the, the Isaac Asimov Foundation, you know, series, right? So if you're a science fiction fan, you know what Second Foundation is. And the goal here is, I know this sounds ridiculous and crazy, but I want to change the world. I want to change the way we think about what motivates us, whether it's in politics or in markets. And what that is, I think, is the role of narrative and story arcs that we share with each other. Uh, that's what I write about. That's what I actually truly believe does shape the world. And so that's the purpose of the, of, of the company. It's to uh, explore that world of narrative so that I can write about it. So that yes, we can invest on it, right? Develop investment strategies around it. It's, but it all comes from that desire to understand and explore the world of narrative. I like to call it the water in which we swim, right? We can't see it, we can't feel it, but we are, we breathe stories and narratives as much as we breathe oxygen. And that's what the company was designed to uh, research and write about and invest in. That's what the company does. Yeah, it's really cool. You know, one of the things you focus on a lot is sort of the common bond we all have together. You know, you talk about your pack and, you know, it, we're, we're talking to you on election day. And, you know, when I watch TV at night right now, it's basically both sides telling me that the world's going to end and my children are going to die if, if the other side wins. And, you know, I think that's so important today, you know, for all of us to kind of focus on what we have in common and to try, try to find our own pack. Well, Jack, I think the way to achieve that is to remember, I like to call them the old stories. Because a lot of the, the, the stories we hear today, I, I like to think of them as they, they are weaponized narratives. And I mean weaponized in exactly the same way we talk about weaponizing a, a virus, right, in a bio lab. It's the intentional insertion, not of a DNA or RNA snippet, but it's the intentional insertion of a certain linguistic grammar, a certain linguistic structure, a certain set of words. We are, and I mean this literally, hardwired to respond to. Our brains are evolved. We are trained from birth to respond, again, literally, biologically, to the words and the story arcs that are presented to us. And I think, sadly, it does make me sad, the largest institutions in our world, big tech, big politics, big media have gotten very good at, again, weaponizing these words in a way that drives our engagement with those institutions, our loyalty to those institutions, because that's where the money is. That's where the power is, is our engagement with these institutions. So to break that engagement, Jack, to your point, to remember and to, you know, that that our, our loyalty and our engagement should not be to a corporation or a political party 
Our engagement should be to each other. I like to call the pack. It, it requires seeing the water in which we swim. And that's hard. And it's two steps forward and one step back. You know, for me, I've been doing this for, you know, researching and writing about this for 30 plus years, but that's what it takes. And, um, the rewards are again, a life well lived, a life that's surrounded by friends, family, and that funded content. Yeah, it's really cool. And I would definitely recommend anybody, you know, check out your website, um, and see what you guys are doing over there. Um, I wonder if on one more part of your portfolio you mentioned, and the, the idea of investing in your house, you know, we, we had Daniel Crosby on the podcast a while back and he actually had decided to pay off his house. And, and he said, you know, he, when he looked at a spreadsheet, it was a horrible decision. This was back when, you know, rates were two, 3%, but it meant a lot to his life. And also just the, you know, just understanding that it was taken care of, understanding that it'd be okay, no matter what happened, that meant a lot to him. I mean, is that sort of your idea too, as, as you sort of invest in your house? Amen to all that. Right. It, it is, it is not a financial investment first and foremost to me, although obviously we live in the real world and that's, that's how I got to think about it. When I say that I'm levered long, right. I mean that I, it's not paid off for me, right. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it requires an active investment for me to maintain and sustain my home and it, and it, it requires some focus. For example, we, you know, we had, um, our, our, the house we used to live in, we kept it, we had it as a rental property and it was like, no, nah, that, that, I don't want to be levered long to Connecticut real estate. That's not the goal. I want to be levered long to my home. So yeah, sold the, 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 the rental properties, all of that, so that it, it's coming back to that first principles. It's not about investing in real estate, although a real estate investment is part and parcel of owning your home. It is thinking of it as separate from or above larger than a real estate investment. I find a lot of people have a hard time doing that, and, and, and that's, that's, that, that's fine. Your home may not be connected with a specific place. For us, it is, right? Because we, this is where, you know, we homeschooled our four kids. Crazy as that, that's the royal we, my wife did it, right? Um, it was the best thing we ever did. It's the best thing we ever did. I wrote a lot about it and it's, it's, it, I'm happy to talk a lot more about that, but it, it would not have been possible without having the home where you homeschool, right? And then without having an area where you could bring other families and kids in to, you know, share some of these experiences where we have sheep and goats and horses and chickens and bees and, 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 and the like, it, a sense of place is very important to me. That's what it means for my home. It may be different for other people. But whatever that means to you, right, that, that sense of home, whether it's connected to a real estate investment or not, I think that is a pillar of what your investment portfolio should be. How do you support that home? It's a specific place. That's what it means to me. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's great to look at home as a place to connect with the people that are most important to you. And, you know, we, we put like, for instance, we put a pool in our house a while back and, you know, that that's not the greatest investment in the world, but I mean, it brings the people you want to have around, it brings them to your house. And so it's hard to put a price on that. Um, you know, it's hard to look that, look at that from financial terms. You know, you really want to look at that as like, it brings the people that are most important in my life together. We have a pool also for very much the same reasons, right? You want to be that place where your kids want to come back to, right? Where they want to hang out, all these kind of aspects to this. My advice, people think about this is, Actually, don't put a price on it. And what does that mean? Of course, you're going to put a price on it. Of course, it has to be connected with real estate in general. What I mean, though, is that in markets, we are constantly using a right, high flutin word, you know, $10 word alert here, right? We're constantly using an expected utility framework to make our investment decisions. So yeah, what, 
what are our units of risk? What sort of, you know, what, what's the risk reward? What's the asymmetry here? Uh, what are the potential paths that this investment could take, et cetera, et cetera. The big heading for this is called expected utility, right? You're trying to calculate the, the odds, the outcomes. That's what we do. That's what, that's what all of us who are involved in markets do for a living. We wrestle with an expected utility framework for making decisions under risk. What I'm saying is that life is not a decision tree under risk. It's decisions under uncertainty. We don't know all the paths our life's going to take. We don't know the odds. It's, that's the difference. It's the unknown unknowns, right? To use Donald Rumsfeld's famous term, right? It's not, not the known unknowns. It's the unknown unknowns. Life is decision-making under uncertainty not decision-making under risk, which is hard to grapple with because in our workaday lives, all of us are doing decisions under risk, expected utility. I believe strongly that the right way to make decisions in a framework of uncertainty is what's called mini-max regret. You're minimizing your maximum regret. It goes back to what we were talking about, about a life well-lived. My maximum regret is looking back and not having that not just relationship with my children, but the satisfaction of betting on them, doing everything I can to have them launch and lead a life worth living of their own. That to me, when I think about these kind of other two pillars of, of my investment portfolio, I will leave the business aside for a while because that's, that's my effort to write on my own terms right? To be who I am on my own terms, not working for someone Let's do it. But my investment in my home, my investments in my children's education, those are my decisions under uncertainty where I want to minimize my maximum regret, not because I'm trying to maximize some utility function by, you know, calculating what it's worth in dollar terms to me. Did that make sense at all? I, I, I feel like sometimes I, I talk about this stuff and it doesn't click, but I just, I just find that questions about how we live our life are so different in shape and form than the decisions we make in our workday. Yeah, no, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I think about that a lot too. I think about like, you know, when, uh, when finally the end comes for me and I'm on my deathbed, like, what am I going to look back and wish I did? Um, and you know, why I need to make sure I'm doing those things now. And it seems like your framework, it really revolves around that idea. You know, you're trying to do the things that you would regret not doing. You're trying to make sure that you are doing them, um, you know, now. That's right. And to do it, I'll call it, say this, in a non-myopic fashion, right? So a non-nearsighted fashion, because I, I think that's what is what we all use to rationalize living for the moment, right? Well, I'll regret it if I don't, you know, have this experience. I don't go on this trip or I don't do X or I don't do Y. And the trick, I think, is to, and this is at the core of wisdom, how do I distinguish be between those, I'll call it more hedonistic, you know, experiences and the experiences that are connected with the pack, the people who mean the most to me. And I'll tell you the story. I've written about this before, too. I... uh before I got into to markets, right? So I was a, I was a professor for a long time in the summer. Uh, this is going to be 26 years ago now. So um, in the summers, I would go teach up in Boston at uh, Simmons College. I was teaching a class up there, and I um, got a, a, a phone call uh, from my parents, and they uh, they had taking the plunge, they had rented a flat for a month in London, which was a city my father you know, loved. And, you know, so there's a, hey, you know, is there any chance you want to come over? So I, I, re I remember, so I went down to Boylston Street to a travel agency, right? This is back when there were physical travel agencies, right? That you'd walk into and, you know, you'd buy a ticket. And what is it? Oh, you know, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be like, I think 600 bucks. 
I could have afforded it. And by afforded it, I mean there was room on my credit card. Is that is another thing we should talk about that? I, I live with debt. I, 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 which would be so anathema to my father and my brother. I was, but, so that's another topic. Maybe we can bookmark that to talk about debt. But I, I could have afforded it, by which I mean I could have put it on my credit card. And I didn't do it. I was like, eh, you know, 600 bucks. You know, it's going to be kind of a long weekend. You know, yeah. oh, I'm not going to. So I, I called my dad back. It was a very short conversation because, you know, that was, you know, they were very concerned about long distance calling, you know, you know, no, and he totally got it. He totally understood. That was fine. Totally got it. And, um, I never saw my father again. I, they came back to me. He died of a heart attack, uh, a, you know, a month or so later, and I never got to see him again. And so I think back to that and how much money I would pay, right? To go on that trip and see my father in a, like I say, a city that he loved. Um, and what bugs me the most is, you know, just, just to be with him, not to do anything, but just to be with him. It's so funny, but the thing that bugs me the most is he was talking about a pub that he really liked there. And for the life of me, I can't remember the name of that pub. And that's something that is stuck with me forever. So when you talk about minimizing maximum regret, right? I didn't do a good job of it there. And that's what I mean about distinguishing between an experience because, oh, that sounds like fun and experience to make that shared connection with the people who are most important to you. I think the latter is what you go into debt for. You do what it takes. You, you have that experience. And I've, it was one of those moments that has stuck with me all the time since. And it's trite to say, you know, life is short and you, you know, have these experiences with the people who mean the most to you. Uh, but until you have that experience of missing out, you don't realize that it's really true. That's something that hits home for me and it's something I need to do a better job of as well. I remember Sahil Bloom on, uh, on Twitter had a story about this where he was out in California um, and he was talking to somebody and they asked like how old his parents were. And they're like, well, they're 75, I think is what he said. And the, the person basically said, well, you know, they've probably got 10 years left. How, how often do you see them? And he's like, well, about once a year. And he's like, well, you're going to see your parents 10 times again in the rest of your life. And, you know, that conversation led him to move to where his parents were so that him and his kids could see his parents all the time. So, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's such an important thing. And it's something I think a lot of us lose track of over time. And, and, I, and I'm not, and I'm not putting out like I'm so great. I mean, I don't, I should be calling my mom every day, right? If, if I'm lucky, I call her once every two weeks, right? And, and it's, and it's the sort of thing I know. Anyway, I, I don't want to get to make this come across as some kind of like sanctimonious or other, but it, it, it has shaped the way I think about my relationship with money and investments. And, um, and it's something I think that a lot of us can balance in a better way. I want to go back to the point you brought up about debt, because the debt is something I struggle with a lot too. You know, on one hand, we can go back to that story of Daniel, Daniel Crosby, like eliminating debt took a, took a lot of pressure off of him. But, you know, I know in my life, I have debt, you know, I have debt on a house, I have debt on a car, you know, and, and I, you can sometimes achieve some things with that debt um, that maybe you, you otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't if you do it in a prudent manner. So how, how do you think about the role of, of debt in your life? Uh, I, I am comfortable with debt. I don't know if I'm a stress junkie. I don't know if I find it, you know, the endorphins or whatever it generates that work for me, but it, I'm, I'm okay with it. And, and when I say I'm okay with it, I'm contrasting it like with my father or my brother, right. For whom having debt, it, it just eats at them, right. They can't stand it. They don't sleep well for me. I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. I, I, I'm okay with debt and it, so I'm, yeah, I, I'm, it's, I've used debt to acquire that home that I'm describing. I've used debt to acquire that education for my children, right? When I say I'm levered long, 
my kids' education in my home. I really mean it. I find it to be the little pinprick that, that kind of motivates me a lot of times, right? I, I mean, it can be a real motivator. And sometimes I kind of need that because I am a procrastinator and, and, and so I need that kind of kick in the pants that, that the necessity of servicing that debt provides. So it's a, it's a, it's a question that I've wrestled with personally. I think the important thing is that you and your partner have similar uh, approaches to debt, but maybe not quite too similar, right? Because if you're both stress junkies, right, that's that can lead to a uh, a magnified situation that can't be sustained. But if you're too far apart, then if the other person is lying awake at night, not being able to sleep because of it, that doesn't work either. So you've got to be, I find, you know, whoever your partner is in your pack, your primary partner, you got to, you got to be on the same page, but not, but not identical. And I, and I think if you can find that, that that's what it takes to make debt a sustaining thing to achieve those goals you have for your home and your pack, uh, without it becoming a um, spear that, you know, goes right into your chest. Since a lot of our listeners will have public portfolios, I did want to briefly touch on that with you. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions before I hand it back to Justin. Um, you know, you've talked about how the market is a public utility. You've talked about how narrative really drives markets, you know, a lot more probably than fundamentals these days. How would you think about if you were building a public portfolio for yourself, how would you think about building it in that world? Yeah. And like I say, I mean, I'm, you know, we, we advise, right, in the, in, in the ways that I, in, in, so I'll do my usual disclaimer that, you know, this is not intended to be any, you know, specific recommendation or anything. Um, my strong view is that publicly traded markets have, there's, there's a lot, you know, to this statement, but they've, they've become casinos. All right, and and I and I, but I, but I mean that not in a pejorative sense. I know it sounds pejorative, and and where it's going to end up is a little bit pejorative. There's been a separation from a cartoonification of the purpose of public markets. Right? What are public markets? Public markets are a place for a transmission belt between capital, my money, and corporations who need that capital to grow, acquire whatever it is they need to, to do. And they give me a fractional ownership share in their cash flows and their obligations and their future. And that's what I get for giving them their capital. That's what a capital is called called capital markets. I think so much of that is just gone, right? So that, so that when we think about investing in public markets, I think very few people are actually thinking about, okay, what's the fractional, you know, ownership share I've got in this cash flow? It's, all right, this, you know, ticker XYZ or this ticker ABC, I'm making a bet on that. And again, I don't mean that to be pejorative. I love casinos. I love that the bet on the ticker and using chips and playing games. I love it. Um, and that's, you know, in my day job, that's what we try to do. We try to play the player, right? And, and not playing the cards, you're playing the player and to think about that systematically. But for a personal portfolio, I, I think it's important to step back and realize that's what I'm doing. It's what I'm prone to do with positions in public markets today. So I, I think there are ways to counteract that. And the, the main way I think is to, I like call it kind of investing in what's real. And it's going to mean different things for different people. I have a very expansive view of what real assets mean. You know, IP can absolutely be a real asset, meaning it has actual cash flows and is actually meaningful to real people in the real world. But I, when I think about investing in public markets, what I recommend 
what I would think about is how can I get closer to those real cash flows from real things for real people in the real economy? And how can I push away from the casino table, the gaming table? Um, unless I want to make a business of sitting at the casino table, right? If that's your business, God bless, that's my business, right? And, and I think you can be pretty good at that, right? But for a personal portfolio, if that's not what you're trying to do, I think it's important to remember what capital markets means and to try to get closer, as close as you can to those real cash flows of real things for real people in the real economy. You've talked about this idea of harvesting the beta sort of in public markets, you know, and investing in your, you know, in yourself, in your personal life. I'm wondering, like, do you think for most investors, indexing is probably a good option, you know, versus, versus trying to figure out like where the cash flows are or, or trying to pick individual companies? I mean, do you think in, in sort of this public utility world that indexing is a good option for most people? Is it a good option? Yeah, I, absolutely. It's so, I say it's a casino table. It's a casino that's run by, one by Wall Street, but it is um, regulated by the government, like all casinos are. And there is a societal requirement that over a period of time, that, that there is a risk premium for, for equities, right? That, that number do go up right over time and the like and so i absolutely think you know as the you can make an investment in that i do in my business right like say i'm long the financial markets in what i do for in my business if that's not your business then absolutely i, I think it makes a ton of sense to be long financial markets because there is this societally supported and societally necessary need for that number to go up over time. So that, that absolutely works. My point earlier, and it's an and not a but, is that and if you're thinking about creating a portfolio of stocks and the like, my recommendation is to think of that in terms of getting closer to the real real cash flows from real things for real people in the real world. Two different things. They can both go together in a portfolio. What would some examples of those real assets actually be? Well, so for example, I mentioned IP earlier. So, so I, I had a, I have a, I have an expansive view of what a real asset means. I don't just mean, oh, property, right? I don't just mean, oh, I want, you know, you know, midstream pipeline, you know, MLPs, that I have a much more expansive view of what real assets means than, you know, real property. In general, what I think of when I think of a real asset, and again, this can be like IP, is does it, I'm saying, does it have a cash flow? I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in that, right? Um, than I am in sort of kind of any sort of other kind of real asset definition. The other part I mentioned though is that, you know, do I get close to it? Where am I in the capital stack? How is this company organized? I mean, do I really have a fractional ownership of, share of this? Or is my equity a stub to some big, you know, debt position? It, those questions interest me. Right. For, and that's what I mean about how do I get as close as I can and as far as away as I can from the derivification, right, that, that Wall Street would like to present. That's what I mean by that, Justin. So you mentioned that you homeschooled, I think, four of you, all four of your children. Wow. Um, how do you, so where are they now in their life? Are they in high school, college, or? There, the, the, the last one left the nest, uh, this year. So, uh, the, the, the oldest, uh, she's 25. And so she works for me in my business. She, uh, uh, went to, uh, USC, uh, did great there. And then, um, you know, Rusty and I hired her to, to, to work in our company. Uh, daughter number two, she also went to USC. What you'll see is that 
all four of my daughters, and I'm a girl dad, so I'm very consistent in my chromosomal contribution. All four of my daughters ended up going out to Los Angeles for, for, for college. It, it's, it's kind of weird. Anyway, I actually like Los Angeles. I think that's got, it's a city with a lot of energy, uh, positive energy. But um, uh, daughter number two, she also went to USC and she's finishing up at uh, Stanford Law School. So that's where, where she is now. Uh, daughter number three is a junior at UCLA. And then daughter number four is a, is a freshman at USC. So three at USC and one uh, UCLA. Uh, one daughter's finishing up uh, at Stanford Law and um, the oldest daughter is, uh, is, is working with me right now. And that's a very special feeling too. That's, that's amazing. They all went to the West Coast. That's, that's very, very interesting. A lot, of, a lot of West Coast travel for you. But I guess the question is, you know, and you've talked about supporting and investing in your children. And, you know, I'm guessing you probably help significantly with their educational costs and help support them during. So, you know, how did you, was that through 529 plans? What just, you know, you tried to support them financially as much as you could. I borrowed it all. Absolutely. Borrowed it all. Okay. Yeah. There's there, there's the debt. There's the debt coming up. I think there's a non-trivial chance I get that written off. I'm not, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. It's been what coming up on two years since I've paid any principal or interest on that. You know, when they start reinstating payments for your student loans, you know, I kind of believe it when I see it. Um, I, that comes across as being trite, but it's, it's part of what I mean by, and I, but I really don't mean it that way. Uh, the, I mean, I have assets to back up the leverage I've taken on by borrowing for their education. But, um, you know, this is what Jack was mentioning earlier when he talks about debt. I'm, I'm pretty happy to take on that debt because I think the repayment terms on that debt are so socially constructed and constructed in such a way, I think there's a non-trivial chance that, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's a pretty good investment for me. Right. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, so that's the answer to for, for you, Justin. Now, now, yeah, that's the answer. Kind of where I was going was, um, you know, some people view it as if you give your kids too much, you're actually taking something away from them because they were kind of given things on a, on a golden plate and they didn't have actually have to work for maybe paying help pay to go to school or, or do, and, but then. I mean, but your girls seem like they're on uh, all on good paths. So I don't think that, you know, we had Rob Arna on the podcast uh, recently and he, we, we asked him sort of this question and, you know, he kind of answered it. He said, you know, every time you give your kids something, you're actually taking something sort of away from them. And, you know, it's just interesting to hear different people's philosophy on money and their kids and how much they want to help and what their kids get out of it. Justin, if you're having these sort of conversations with yourself about um, your kids when they're going off to college, you've waited way too long to have those conversations. And for, for us, when I say that one of the best things we ever did was the homeschooling, is connected very much with that. I mean, my kids did all the work on our farm, right? Whether those animals lived or died, it was up to them. And developing that kind of responsibility and putting in the actual work, the actual work, that's, that creates a human's relationship with money and responsibility for the rest of their lives, right? It's, so like I say, if you're, if you're wrestling with this stuff at, when they're going off to college, it's too late. I just, it has to start a lot, a, a lot earlier. I get Rob's point, but my strong belief around college is that in this society of today, it is crucially important to get your passport stamped, right? Uh, now there are different ways to get your passport stamped. You don't have to get your passport stamped by going to a top, whatever college you can get it in grad school. Uh, you can get it by a company you work for. 
So there are lots of ways to get your passport stamp, to be accredited in this world that we are living in. But I think that one of the best ways or one of the clearer paths to getting your passport stamped is to go to a, you know, top whatever school. And that's not because the education is going to be better or anything like that. I, I, I don't believe that for, I was a professor for 15 years, right? I know what a crappy situation it is and it's bullshit. So much it's just bullshit, but it's our bullshit. And, uh, getting that passport stamped matters. And so that's, that's for me, part of what it means a lot to me to be able to take care of my pack by providing that. I have no doubt that my kids couldn't get their passport stamped on their own efforts somewhere else, but to be able to give that to them, I don't think that takes away anything. What I think it does is like a passport, it opens up a world for them to go then uh, explore and do well in. What do you think about giving money to kids beyond college? Cause you know, I think that was one of the things Rob was, was struggling with is, you know, he had set up trusts for his kids for like the rest of their lives. And, you know, we had going back to our interview with Daniel Crosby, you know, he, he sort of talked about that. He, he kind of said him and his wife have a dis different view on this because he sort of feels like if his kids want to be, you know, a painter, they should be able to be a painter. And so if he has the financial wherewithal to set them up so they can do something they love, doesn't necessarily make money. He wants to continue, you know, giving them money throughout sort of their lives. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, I struggle with that a lot because I have young kids myself. Like, how do you think about that? I don't think there's any one size fits answer in the same way that every one of your kids is very different from each other. I, it just, it's just astounding to me how different they are, right? Same, same chromosomal contributions from the same two people. And my God, they're so different. They're so different. Some does exist. So I'm not paying for law school. Right. So, you know, that college, that getting that passport stamp, that the top, whatever college, right. That's on me. I'm going to take care of that. Right. What you're doing beyond that, that's going to be on you. I will say in terms of grad school, right. Which I went through and you're sorry, I think it's one of the biggest rackets in the world, at least, you know, in the uh, academic graduate school. Right. Um, and that's, that's a whole nother conversation. But, you know, my daughter, she wanted to go to law school. My wife's a lawyer. Um, my daughter, she wanted to go to law school. That's on her. And she's making now the life decision beyond that, that she'll be able to pay off that debt and, you know, live her life. If I had a, a daughter who had a compulsion to paint or to sculpt or, or do art, I, I think one can and should help. If it's that sort of compulsion and again, compulsions of that, you know, it's, it's not a nice word, but I, I, I actually think that's what it takes. And I think the test for that is if they don't have that kind of support, do they paint, sculpt, act, whatever, is it a compulsion or is it kind of an ego thing? And I, and I think some kids are self-aware enough to know what they have to be and what they have to do. And if they are one of those children that I want to support them. If they're not sure, then they need to figure that out. They need to figure that out if it's that kind of difficult word, compulsion, in which case, okay, you got to do it, so I'm going to help you. But if it's not, then, then that kind of leads to a difficult situation, right, where um, I, I think it's more important for your kids to learn about themselves and figure out you know, what their identity is and that sometimes money can get in the way of them actually discovering what that is. Ben, this has been a pretty wide ranging, pretty, it has, has it? <laughs> pretty deep and pretty honest <laughs> conversation. So we, uh, we appreciate it. I think we could probably spend at least another hour with you, but, um, unfortunately we'll have to just have you back sooner than you think. That's the answer. <laughs> That's the answer. I'll, I'll come on. Um, <laughs> but we, we do like to ask our guests one sort of final question and it's sort of centered around this personal portfolio, but you can kind of take it, um, and, and relate it to your, the way you think about your investment, everything we've talked about. But if you could impart one lesson that you've learned or thought about in building your investment portfolio, um, 
and you could explain that to your average investor, what would that be? Uh, it would be two things. The first is what I said earlier about investing in the real. And that, that, that has different meanings for different people. But for me, at least, it's getting as close as you can to real cash flows from real things made for real people in the real economy. The other is this notion of finding your pack and finding your own identity and the difficulty you're going to have doing that working for a large corporation. Uh, the thing that I've been, that I've been trying to do for about 15 years now is find a way to stay in our business, right? Financial markets and, and, and the like, because it does provide me with the living to, for funded contentment in the life I want to live without being in the belly of the beast, without either compromising my, uh, autonomy, my authenticity for what I write, but also for not compromising my identity in what I want to say and who I want to be. And that. That's the biggest advice I've got is don't compromise on that. Doesn't mean you have to quit your job tomorrow, but find that path so that you're not compromising your own identity and your own authenticity. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. My pleasure, guys. Really a pleasure. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube, or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.